First, some context. There was controversy with advertising which looked like a line from Black Lives Matter. Politicists reacted poorly to that because that's whenever something references reality, they have to react to it. I made a video about it about two years ago. To top that off, Eidos, with pressure from Square Enix, was forced to put the wonderful world of microtransactions in their single-player game. Yes, that universally loved word in gaming, which would allow players to buy Praxis kits and other things for only one of their saved files. Though this business model has luckily nothing to do with the game's story and plot, the authority from Square Enix unfortunately and apparently forced this game to be split into two so that a sequel could have been made rather easily. This is simply a disclaimer, as you, the audience, will undoubtedly guess where this plot analysis is heading. This is also a bit of news trivia, as in April 2018, Eidos, after partnering with Marvel Entertainment, was looking for a monetization specialist, as they have the rights to make a series of Avenger games. Microtransactions were also present in their 2015 release of Rise of the Tomb Raider. We're two years after the events of the ending of Human Revolution, and Jensen is amazingly alive and fine. No explanation how. There was some airplane incident where an AUG attacked a cockpit and the plane exploded, but now he's on a mission to stop some kind of bad guy from selling black market goods, but not making the arrest and instead keeping other bad guys called the Jin from joining the main fight with his team. You have the first option to play in a lethal or non-lethal way, which is a nice touch to the Deus Ex combat formula. We've got a UC in there. Might be easier to maintain. Wait, a what? Along with your choice of lethal or non-lethal equipment, you get another choice based on weapon ranges. This is also good but feels a bit impractical as the commander of the team is talking to an AUG specialist about how he's going to do his job when everyone probably should have been ready to do exactly what they were going to do before they got into the plane. This choice could also have been reduced to one with four options. Still, the focus is player agency, even if the narrative is making it look like the commander is unprepared and not sure what to do with this augmented team member, who's apparently going in solo, and apparently good enough to fight off an entire group of enemies alone. We get this cutscene, which appears rather odd to me. It's as if the objects on the ground are small miniatures of a model, they kind of appear closer than they seem, and not the real thing. This might have to do something with the lighting, or the rendering engine affecting textures, or perhaps the camera angle, or the level of detail, I can't quite say. There's just something off about it. Once Jensen then Icarus jumps off the plane, we then get a very proper sense of scale, so that's much better. We get a neat speech-to-text in-game cutscene, which is a bit distracting while playing. You got ball sink, executing a buy with a sandstorm on her ass. I cannot take credit for Mother Nature, mister. You can call me Shepherd. I'll be the call. Wait, I thought Singh already knew who Shepard was. What's going on here? This is Aran Singh, the undercover agent who lured Shepard out of his hole. Best you see Interpol's got. For three years he's worked hard to get him tight with the Jin, an Iraqi smuggling cartel that's infected the Eastern Hemisphere like a plague. Last week, our arms dealer sent a message to the Jin, offering to sell them a shitload of black market merchandise dirt cheap. They told Singh to handle a buy. They're not gonna like it when Interpol disrupts that party. Is things cover really that good? It is right now. We need to keep it that way. Okay, so he lured him out, but they never actually met or corresponded. Uh, maybe he's acting, being undercover. Uh, so they were all working through intermediaries? Okay. So whatever transaction was about to happen, which was hard to follow, gets ambushed by some third parties in masks. And everyone shoots everyone else up. And we have a reverse Malik scenario where we have to stop a chopper from taking off. But we don't care who everyone is, so there's really no drama. And this is a non-lethal stealth playthrough. There's no action either, but that's by choice. And apparently Adam just pulls a breakfast cereal box shaped battery from the chopper and it just stops the chopper. Like from a battery shaped holding box, which has a positive and negative sign at the top in case you weren't clear it was a battery. Uh, who designed the electrical schematic on choppers in the future here? Can anyone just pull the thing out and it's done and boom? How about gravity or air pressure or turbulence? How about a, a screwed metal brace on the top to keep the thing in place? Or maybe a strap at least, or maybe some tape? 
Nope, just, you just pull the battery out from its socket and boom. Chopper can't fly anymore. Okay. You're welcome. Hey, that was not my kill count. This is a non-lethal playthrough. If I was a Batman-style character, I'd be kind of pissed off right now. And what the hell is Adam doing standing around in a battlefield just because he removed a battery from a chopper? Suddenly the sandstorm comes and we fade to orange, and then more Icarus symbolic imagery. And here we get a post-opening cinematic which pretty much erases the events of the ending choice of the previous game. Now, there's no save import, and all your choices meant nothing anyway, but in this instance, Ma Jensen is magically alive. He survived the events of the ending despite being on the bottom of the ocean, and apparently Eidos went with the last ending, the fourth one, which is, I've gone over detail in the last Human Revolution plot analysis video I made, as being the most nihilistic, murderous, and insane version of a hero's choice we've ever seen. It invalidates Adam as a character and everything you as a player did even in a lethal playthrough. You just kill everyone, including yourself, but apparently being half a metal man at the bottom of the ocean and blowing up a giant tower you're in, which kills everyone in it, including other augmented people who are closer to the surface, allow you to survive and somehow float to the top of this Arctic Ocean facility that's 1.5 kilometers deep. Because insane, murdering, explosive heroes that turn into terrorists our sequel material. Agent Jensen. I won't let it happen again. What do you mean you won't let this happen again? You caused it. You won't decide to blow up everyone when given the choice again, yet miraculously survived? Okay, so we're playing the I shouldn't have been a nihilistic mass murdering suicide bomber, yet I'm still alive card? Adam doesn't seem too broken up about it. In an ending which is inspired by Battlestar Galactica and meant to be interpretive nonsense, we're now trying to guess Adam's mental state and reason for being, or whatever he's trying to do. Is he an anti-hero? Does he want people to die? Does he want to die himself? Does he like being augmented anymore? Does he want to save augments? Does he want to save everyone else? Why the change of hearts? What is his motivation? What is the players? Why am I playing this game? Imagine choosing the refusal ending in Mass Effect 3, but instead of being proud of defying the big bad by just giving up, you actively kill everyone on Earth because you didn't want them to become Reapers or something. And for some reason in the sequel, you survived. The Reapers didn't kill everyone, and the galaxy seems broken but alive. You still play as Shepard, but Shepard doesn't want to make that choice again for okay, yeah, things, bad things are bad, but why did you do them? Why did Adam make this choice? Why is the narrative telling us that's what Adam did? What is Adam's plot here? Is this a story of redemption? Is Jensen now living with his painful choice that's now a mistake to him? He seems pretty well adjusted. What's going on here? So, as you can tell from the production value, we're already off to a great start. Numbers, more numbers, meaning more meaningless numbers. What? Th then there's this big old exposition dump from the Illuminati. They didn't like the ending of Human Revolution, uh, something called the Human Restoration Act. Rand and Stanton go to New York with political and financial influence for the act to pass. Elizabeth, Lucius, Dowd's money, Nathaniel Brown, alternate strategy from Bob Page with a sleeper cell. Janus and the Juggernaut Collective. But Janus won't be an issue because semi-Asian old guy made arrangements. Got it? Okay. Now we have no idea who's doing what and why, why the protagonist was doing what they're doing and why, what the antagonist wants really, and what the hell happened really two years ago. Everything is up in the air, but we pulled a battery out of a helicopter, so that's okay. Go, go, gadget, pre-cyberpunk electrical engineering. Oh, the beginnings and endings of this story are going to be fantastic. Thank <laughs> you.